Greetings environmentalists and we are going to go over lecture 15. Only five more to go for this semester. Isn't that awesome? So let's get busy learning about invasive species. Our goals today are to talk about the cause and effects of invasive species and how they impact the environment. We'll look at several pathways that invasive species enter new territories and how that can impact the environment in those locations. And then we'll evaluate major invasive species of the United States. So we'll start off with the video to kind of introduce you to what an invasive species is. I'll see you back in a few minutes. Massive vines that blanket the southern United States, climbing as high as a hundred feet as they uproot trees and swallow buildings. A ravenous snake that is capable of devouring an alligator. Rabbit populations that eat themselves into starvation. These aren't horror movie concepts, they're real stories. But how could such situations exist in nature? All three are examples of invasive species. Organisms harmful not because of what they are, but where they happen to be. The kudzu vine, for example, had grown quietly in its native East Asia, eaten by various insects and dying off during the cold winters. But its fortunes changed when it was imported into the southeastern United States for porch decoration and cattle feed. Its planting was even subsidized by the government to fight soil erosion. With sunny fields, a mild climate, and no natural predators in its new home, the vine grew uncontrollably until it became known as the plant that ate the South. Meanwhile, in Florida's Everglades, Burmese pythons, thought to have been released by pet owners, are the cause of decreasing populations of organisms. They're successfully outcompeting top predators, such as the alligator and panther, causing a significant reduction in their food sources. They're not a problem in their native Asia because diseases, parasites, and predators help to control their population size. And in Australia, European rabbits eat so many plants that they wipe out the food supply for themselves and other herbivores. They're a pretty recent addition, intentionally introduced to the continent because one man enjoyed hunting them. Like the Burmese pythons, various factors in their native habitat keep their numbers in control. But in Australia, the lack of predators and a climate perfect for year-long reproduction allows their populations to skyrocket. So why does this keep happening? Most of the world's ecosystems are the result of millennia of co-evolution by organisms, adapting to their environment and each other until a stable balance is reached. Healthy ecosystems maintain this balance via limiting factors, environmental conditions that restrict the size or range of a species. These include things like natural geography and climate, food availability, and the presence or absence of predators. For example, plant growth depends on levels of sunlight and soil nutrients. The amount of edible plants affects the population of herbivores, which in turn impacts the carnivores that feed on them and a healthy predator population keeps the herbivores from becoming too numerous and devouring all the plants. But even minor changes in one factor can upset this balance, and the sudden introduction of non-native organisms can be a pretty major change. A species that is evolved in a separate habitat will be susceptible to different limiting factors, different predators, different energy sources, and different climates. If the new habitat's limiting factors fail to restrict the species growth, it will continue to multiply, outcompeting native organisms for resources and disrupting the entire ecosystem. Species are sometimes introduced into new habitats through natural factors like storms, ocean currents, or climate shifts. The majority of invasive species, though, are introduced by humans. Often this happens unintentionally, as when the zebra mussel was accidentally brought to Lake Erie by cargo ships. But as people migrate around the world, we have also deliberately brought our plants and animals along, rarely considering the consequences. 
But now that we're learning more about the effects of invasive species on ecosystems, many governments closely monitor the transport of plants and animals and ban the imports of certain organisms. But could the species with the most drastic environmental impact be a group of primates who emerged from Africa to cover most of the world? Are we an invasive species? So you just learned kind of an overview of what an invasive species is. Remember, it's not what it is, it's where the invasive species lives. It's in a place where it can enjoy population growth without much uh, check and balance. So if you introduce a species, for example, uh, the bunnies that you saw, the rabbits in Australia, they could just reproduce over and over and over again with, a, with virtually year-round growing season. And that's going to lead to unavailable food resources, out-competing other uh, animals and organisms for the same uh, nutrients that they need. Invasive species are a problem, so they're harmful non-native plants and animals and even microorganisms. So non-native plants and animals don't belong where they really shouldn't be. In other words, we really don't want to be reintroducing new things to other places uh, from our continent to another continent and vice versa. Exotic species that commonly do not have a natural predator when placed in a new environment typically are what we call an invasive species. Invasive species do not always have to be harmful to an environment. Sometimes they're fairly neutral. Take a look at our pet dog over here to the right. So d domesticated dogs, domesticated dogs, cats, horses, cows, chickens, etc., are typically considered to be non-indigenous species to North America. A couple of indigenous species that you might not recognize as being uh, originals to North America would be something like the camel and uh, now it is indigenous to another continent. Many invasive species have become negatively associated with nuisance and disturbance factors. For a very good reason they've earned that title. Not all foreign species take up residence and grow wildly like bamboo. On McLennan Community College campus, on the campus from which I am currently working, we are overrun with bamboo and bamboo if you've ever had it in your yard once you get it there it's impossible to get out we used to have some at my house in houston and it didn't matter what we did to try to remove it it always came back so many plant species can only survive within the confines of cultivation and fertilizer the best example being domesticated crops most invasive terrestrial vertebrate, meaning having a backbone species, require the care of humans in order to survive. So let's examine some pathways for invasive species and explain what that pathway means. By definition, a pathway is the process by which a foreign species enters a non-indigenous area or territory. There are many different pathways for species to reach a foreign destination or location, and some species even use multiple pathways. So you're looking at an old growth forest here on the left, and could there be an endangered species there or that's being impaired by an invasive species? Are there any invasive species present? Part of the equation is understanding and knowing what your native habitat looks like. One way that invasive species can be brought as a pathway is for aesthetics. The kazoo vine that you learned about earlier in the video were brought to the United States and also other places in the world because they, people thought they were pretty. They looked good. They were nice, cute, pretty plants. It's especially true for exotic plants in gardens. When I think about this particular plant, the campus from which I work, we have this kazoo here and it's a real problem. Like we first found it over a decade ago and call, or called the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and they're like, no, it's not in Texas. That's not, it's impossible. So we took photos, sent it to them, and they're like, well, darn it, we guess we better come out and take a look. <laughs> sure enough, uh, they discovered that we had it everywhere. So how did it get here? 
probably someone had purchased it as a plant, got, uh, probably fell off their porch and took root, and it is all over the place now. It doesn't matter how many times we cut it down, uh, how many times we try to kill it with herbicides, it doesn't matter even when we've done a prescribed burn, it hasn't taken the problem away. Instead, it comes back with more of a vengeance. Very common way for many invasive species, a pathway that is, to make it to another continent is via cargo and stowaway. In other words, they're in a ship like this, a freighter. Some species were never supposed to be taken around the world, but they basically hitchhiked. They uh, got on board an international ship because of something called ballast water, which we'll talk about in a minute. This can either occur in the ship's ballast waters, which is uh, essentially the water that they put inside here so the vessel can travel more effectively in open seas, or it can actually be within the cargo that's loaded on the ship itself. Either way, it ends up to a new destination. So let's look at some pathways for invasive species. This is the St. Lawrence River at Montreal. It's the gateway to the world's largest freshwater ecosystem, the Great Lakes. You wouldn't know it, but right beneath these waters, there's an ecological battlefield. Wars are being fought, wars for space, wars for resources. Wars between exotic and native species, and uh, we're not sure who's winning. Biological invasion is an ancient process. It's been around since the, throughout the entire history of life on the planet. Species have always changed their ranges. They've always spread into new regions. But what's happening now is fundamentally different in terms of rate and spatial scale. When ships cross the high seas, they have to carry weight so as to avoid bobbing like a cork. And this weight is provided in the ballast tanks. At any given moment, it's been estimated that between 5,000 and 10,000 species are in motion in ship ballast tanks around the world. These species are taken up in the water at the home port when the ship is taken on ballast water and are discharged at the new port of call. One helpful way to think about it is to start big Sort of think globally and realize that every port on Earth is connected by shipping. Maybe directly if a ship goes from point A to B, maybe indirectly if a ship has gone to other ports in between. So the potential exists for a species in any port on Earth to be delivered to the Great Lakes region. So the study of these species combines understanding trade and human movements of species with the ecology of these species. Today we're in the Solange Canal. It's just uh, west of Montreal, about 45 minutes. Solange Canal is just off of the St. Lawrence River. And today we're going to be jumping into the water, sampling the wall to look at the composition of the zebra and the quagga mussel along the wall here. Zebra mussel is an exotic mussel that was introduced in the late 1980s into the Great Lakes through ballast water. They have since spread up into the St. Lawrence River area along with the quagga mussel. They are both invasive species. They've come from the Black and Caspian Seas. And they, although they are closely related, there are subtle differences between the two species. And one of the things is looking at who comes in and colonizes first, looking at differences in species life history traits that can help to predict which species are going to be more successful. processing the samples that were taken from the Solange Canal. We have about a 12-year data set, so we're documenting the change of the mussel composition in that area. There used to be a high abundance of native mussels, and now oftentimes what you'll see is just a, a whole bunch of empty native mussel shells littering the bottom uh, where they once used to be. So with the native mussels sitting in the sediment from here, we have an exposed hard substrate to which zebra mussels and quagga mussels can attach themselves onto the hard substrates of the native mussels. The problem with this is that you get enough zebra and quagga mussels attached to the native mussel 
therefore suturing the two valves together. This muscle can no longer filter feed. And sometimes even due to the sheer weight of the other uh, exotic muscles on it, topples into the substrate and can no longer uh, feed and thus it uh, dies. Essentially what we're seeing here is an ecological takeover. For the past two centuries, nearly 200 species that we know about have become established in the Great Lakes. These species have replaced native species, have become pests economically and ecologically, have fouled industrial water supply systems, have fouled municipal water supply systems, have posed a threat to fisheries. Unless shipping is very well controlled, unless we have a more effective way at keeping species that are delivered through ballast water or keeping them out, then we can assume that invasions will continue. Many of the species we're concerned about do come from other continents, but many of them also come from other parts of North America. All right, I got it. What do we got? Got plenty of rusty surprise, crayfish, surprise. it looks like. Don't see any native crayfish yet. Probably won't. It's useful to think about these invasions just like we think about a flu virus or any other infectious disease moving across the country. When there's a lake close to your lake that's infected, that means that you're now much more likely to be infected. Rusty crayfish are actually native to the Ohio River area of Ohio and parts of Kentucky, some parts of Indiana, and they were moved up to this area in the upper Midwest, most likely by anglers use them as bait for fishing. A lot of times, when species are transported just a few hundred miles, they can have very significant impacts. Rusty crayfish essentially clear cut the whole bottom. That's very important because vegetation serves as food base for lots of other organisms and also as habitat for small fishes. So when rusty crayfish come out, all you are left with is pretty much a lake with lots of rusty crayfish and not much else. What we're working on now is a technique in which we could combine intensive trapping with increasing the numbers of predatory fish that would make the reduction in crayfish sustainable. Got some? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, today we are collecting fishes um, using fight netting, and we're going to perform gastric lavage, a non-lethal method of examining the stomach contents of the fish. Jody, the next one is a smallmouth bass. Right. 296 grams. We're most interested in knowing which fish species and what sizes of fish species are eating what sizes of crayfish. And you can see the crayfish claw. Oh yeah, okay. that's definitely crayfish. Yep, he's clear. And with that information, we will be able to uh, determine what fish community will be most effective at controlling rusty crayfish. We invest so much effort and resources in studying invasive species because they are one of the top five causes of changes in ecosystems globally. In fact, the changes that invasive species are causing proceed much more rapidly than climate change. With the increased scientific understanding that's come from recent research, we are helping to uh, guide legislation that would address the ballast water pathway and other pathways that bring species that will be harmful to these natural ecosystems. That gave you a really good overview as to some of the pathways for invasive species. And one of the things I wanted to point out was how cool those jobs are that these people have in order to study things like invasive species. So I, I got to do that kind of job when I worked for the Brazos River Authority. And if you're interested in a job like that, that's in the field and has some uh, work in an office where you can analyze the data that you collect and even some laboratory experience, these are jobs that are out there. And this field can help you get to those points and to those jobs. 
So let's define what ballast water was, or is. I promised you earlier that we'd talk more about it. Now that you've seen what ballast water does in that video, you're able to see that they take in the water so they can be able to sustain and operate in the open seas, and then they discharge those before or in a port. So ballast gather water, organisms, rocks, and gravels in foreign areas and then dump their contents in a port upon arrival. Plant seeds can take a ride in the ballast and then sprout up from various nautical disposal sites. Now the United States had to take some action for this because we had such a problem with invasive species. That brings us to the topic of the National Invasive Species Act passed in 1996. So you learned about the zebra mussel a little bit earlier from the Great Lakes, and this is kind of where this stemmed from. Basically, this law requires that all ships entering U.S. ports must empty their ballast tanks before they enter what's called our exclusive economic zone, known as the EEZ, guaranteed test question. <laughs> so, and I'll explain what an exclusive economic zone is in just a minute. Nevertheless, they have to empty these tanks before they get into the EEZ to help reduce the introduction of invasive species to waters of the United States. Now, what is an exclusive economic zone? Notice there's no environmental word in there. EEZs begin about 200 nautical miles offshore and place strict fishing quotas uh, on areas to prevent overfishing and overharvesting by placing special rights over the exploration and use of marine resources. Let me explain that 200 nautical miles is from the shoreline of the continental shelf. So that can vary based on where your continental shelf begins and ends for an area. But basically, in short terms, basically the, the United States or any country like us that has waters that's adjacent to it that is in the ocean owns the stuff that's in the water and owns the stuff in the ground. So that can apply to petroleum, natural gas, other fossil fuels, certainly into the biological aspects that we're looking at right here. Let's say there's a shipwreck within their nautical miles, 200 nautical mile range from their coastlines. Well, guess whose stuff that is? <laughs> you, uh, you don't just get to claim it and you can go, well, there's maritime law and stuff like that, international water laws. Well, when it comes to the exclusive economic zone, every country who has access to it wants to protect what their resources are. United States has the largest exclusive economic zone in the world. And when we acquired Hawaii and Alaska, that really added in the amount of nautical miles that you have to uh, claim. Let me point out, though, if you intersect with a country, that 200 nautical miles is separated equally between the two countries. So there may not even be but 10 nautical miles between countries. I'm thinking of Cuba and Florida, for example. And in that case, it's the distance between the two are split in half. So there's no magical line at the bottom of the ocean that so shows where the EEZ is located. It's based on GPS coordinates. Very important concept to realize the value and economic and intrinsic need and the protection that a continent or a, a like the United States, we would basically go to war to protect our exclusive economic zones, especially if it entailed some type of uh, fossil fuel reserve, which is certainly the case when you look at the Gulf of Mexico, when you consider some of the oil reserves up here towards the Arctic Circle. When you look at the ballast water in a a freighter is going across the ocean, it's just got to take in that extra water in order to navigate through the open seas. So they're taking in whatever the water was where they're in port before they head out to sea, and then they discharge it when they get to the new port. The difference for the United States is that we make them empty it before they get to a certain point in our exclusive economic zone. So if they don't, then not only do we have the rights to... Uh, take and seize their materials that they have on their cargo on their ship, we also can uh, seize the actual ship itself and deal with that consequence. So it's a big deal to be shipping into North America, especially after the zebra mussel was introduced into our area. 
A third pathway for organisms is domestication. People need plants and animals to survive. Sometimes we want them more than we need them. So we domesticated various plants and animals to guarantee that they will always be available when we need them for our desired use or uses. This pathway can refer to either food or companionship, like you got a couple of pairs of Labradors there. I don't think they're food, I think they're companionship. This pathway is also unique in the fact that it involves global trade for exotic pets. Some pets are prohibited from being uh, shipped to the United States, and we'll be talking about that a little later when we get into endangered species. An exotic pet, occasionally these pets may escape or be uh, an irresponsible owner, a scumbag pet owner is what we call them, that will turn their exotic pets loose in a local area that is an alien habitat where they can reproduce and dominate. This is how alligators end up in our sewers and, and anacondas often overrun the Everglades. So I, you know, never even thought about an alligator coming up through my toilet, but recently I met somebody who this was like their perpetual fear. And uh, they're from Florida, so I guess they have a pretty good reason to feel that way. But now I look before I go, and I hope that you would too, because this is how our alligators get there, is uh, they're dropped off or they uh, somebody had them as a pet when they were little, got too big, and they needed to get rid of them. So before you buy an exotic pet, think about the long-term care of that animal. And it's not fair, it's not right, it's not ethical uh, to do that to these animals. Fourth way that we can have a pathway for invasive species is through food. Closely related to domestication, but not always the same thing because we do not eat everything that is domesticated. People can bring some plants and animals to a new territory to provide a stable food resource. Most of the uh, agricultural practices and species we use are European, thus making most of them and our food sources invasive species. So, looking at the cow over there, is that beef stew? If you know what kind of cow that is, you can answer the question. A fifth way for a pathway for invasive species is through game, and we're talking about hunting and recreation right here. Some species are taken abroad for luxury prey for hunters, and exotic game ranches exist all over the world and represent a small percentage of invasive species in comparison to stuff that comes over on freighter uh, boats, not even a comparison. But nevertheless, it is one that we need to discuss as a pathway for invasive species. Is this an invasive species? Do you see that deer right there? Well, this is in uh, the backyard of a friend of mine's house and you're looking at that, it is not, it shouldn't be in that area. And the real answer is, is that really its home or did we move into its home? So I'm wanting you to think about that every time that something's being built, are we displacing something that is its native habitat? Was it introduced uh, to us as an invasive species? Now it's become part of the ecosystem or are we the most incredible invasive species ever? So we're going to take a look at that. Number six, biocontrol. When one invasive grows unchecked for a long period of time, game wardens or officials may elect to introduce other invasive species to the area to serve as a predator. Deer are a case in point. So um, this can be a case that happened back when my parents owned a lake house where they retired in Lake Travis near Austin. So they lived in Williamson County, actually, and uh, on the North Shore. And it was a real problem because this area used to be so remote. And then all of a sudden, people started building up and the deer had nowhere to go. So they were overpopulating. Uh, they didn't have a natural predator to control the population. So Texas Parks and Wildlife came and relocated some of them and took them elsewhere so they could actually try to find a balance with their ecosystem. This can be rather risky if the predator's population becomes the next big problem. So you have to counterbalance. An ecosystem needs a sense of balance. And if you get one side overdone, like you get the herbivores way out of check and the predators are too low or vice versa, you're going to have a long-term ecological imbalance. So 
Invasive species, when you look at before biocontrol uh, insects were released, the purple loose drife uh, infested wetlands near Minnesota. And when you look at what happened after the biocontrol insects were released, it kind of backfired, didn't it? The intention was good, but in just three years, we went from left to right. So sometimes we, our decisions may not be the wisest and we need to learn from them. What's another pathway for invasive species, and that's skins. For a long time, some cultures would grow exotic animals with the intent of skinning them and selling them on the global market, meaning selling their fur. The skins were worn as clothes or used for records in lieu of paper, especially back in uh, many hundreds of years ago. So this is a mink coat on the right, and minks are really famous for having exceptionally beautiful fur. So as you may or may not own uh, something like this, you need to consider, are you allowing for this process to occur? Research is the eighth pathway for invasive species. Scientists must seek out species to test medicines and products on before releasing their products to the public. So most of the time they're done on a high, fast growing populations like rodents, for example. The rat and the chimpanzees are among preferred species to serve as test subjects, and they are both non-indigenous to North America. So when you think about rats, and you think about every test that's done on rats, it's because they can be reproduced really, really quickly. Chimpanzees are very close in uh, DNA to humans, and that's one of the reasons they're used to test uh, for human carcinogens and other such things. A ninth pathway is tourism for invasive species. Many people pay money to travel to places like a zoo or a safari ranch. So zoos are filled with exotic animals and creatures, most of which are not indigenous to the area that hosts the zoo. So you may have strong feelings for or against a zoo, but in many cases, zoos are simply a way to take care of animals who are disabled and allow the public an appreciation for wildlife they would not otherwise get to see. Another pathway for invasive species is work. For example, the horse. The horse originally came from Europe and Asia, but in North America they were required for production, farming, and so forth. Without workhorses, America would have starved. We would have not been successful. Horses back in the civilization of uh, the United States was a critical thing to have for survival. Other types of work may include sea eyeing dogs, lab rats again, other things that you think of that animals are put to work for some use. Another pathway is migration. Some invasive species travel to new lands because over uh, colonization, they've overtaken one area and uh, they have to seek out new habitats, so they go in search of that. So. African killer bees, uh, so Africanized bees are an example of that. They came from uh, South America, worked their way through Central America, and in through North America. So you can kind of look at the timeline there for when it started, uh, when they arrived in Brazil and worked their way up into North America. And it, while it took a few decades to do, uh, Africanized bees are real, and they exist even in this area. What's another way for an invasive species to be deposited? And I'm kind of rolling my eyes a bit because for those of you who've taken geology, or if you haven't, you're going to learn about the goods of a future coprolite. What's a coprolite? Well, those are ancient fossilized uh, remains of poo, if you want to put it that way, or dung. So digestive systems are another uh, pathway for invasive species. Some species seeds are carried in the gut of an animal across the ocean and deposited on foreign soils when they take a dump. So other times this may be included in a hay or straw that's shipped internationally to feed foreign livestock. So it's kind of important to know what is in your hay or what animals are uh, taking up their necessary place of relieving themselves and putting out that new copper light material. Many countries like Korea, Japan, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Taiwan import their hay and straw for livestock animals. That is setting themselves up for invasive species. Hay straw sometimes includes unexpected guests such as seeds from various bycatch harvested with the in, uh, intended hay or straw. 
When an animal eats the unexpected seeds, the seeds pass through the animal and deposit it amidst a pile of refined, moist nutrients. And I think you can get the gist right there, right? Where they are likely to germinate and start an invasive plant. So when you think about uh, an example in the United States as animals um, were taken with people who were colonizing the United States and moving west to, especially during the gold rush, uh, some of the plants were deposited as animals ate them, their seeds got deposited, and cactus would be an example of how that worked. Now, Japan is perhaps the most strict in inspecting hay before it reaches the shore to try to prevent contaminated hay that could have invasive species. The Japan uh, or Japanese Plant Production and Quarantine Service presides as zero tolerance, and that's pretty it's, it's substantial, zero tolerance standard on hay contaminated with the seas of quack grass. And you're like, what the heck is quack grass? Well, it's over there on the left. If quack grass is identified, the entire shipment will be blocked from importation. So they're very serious about this because quack grass has caused them a lot of problems. So what are the major invasive species of the United States? When it comes to insects, no doubt that the Africanized honeybee ranks as number one. Insects are unintentional stowaways on an international cargo ships, and the honeybee that's the killer bee certainly is an example. It originally came from Africa and was hybridized in South America during the 1950s. So it mated with those other types of bees and came a separate kind of group. And that's what happened. And we first found it in Texas in 1990. So I have a couple of personal stories I could share with Africanized bees if you want to visit with me one-on-one. -on -one. They're kind of funny, but they're scary at the same time. So my ex-husband was a beekeeper, and uh, so we would often go retrieve honey, and one of our fears was that the Africanized bees would be out there. And uh, sure enough, uh, it happened, and they are definitely in Texas. The Asian tiger mosquito came from Asia and arrived in Hawaii during the 1800s and was recorded in the continental United States in 1985. Now, Realistically, no mosquito is going to be uh, taking a journey across the Pacific from Hawaii to the continental United States, so they must have hitched a ride on a plane or a boat. A red and pointed fire ant, and all of us know this and fire ant all too well, but keep in mind it was imported. Also known as a fire ant, came from South America and showed up in the United States around 1930, and we're still trying to get rid of it. If you didn't know, its natural predator is actually... Um, a scorpion. So as we tried to reduce the scorpion population, the red ant population went boop, went skyrocket, and the fire ants kind of got out of control. So let's look at reptiles and amphibians. The green iguana is one that's very commonly cited as invasive species in the United States. More than any other vertebrate, reptiles and amphibian has risen at an exponential rate in modern age time as invasive species. The invasive percentages of reptiles and amphibians have doubled every 40 years in the United States, which I find astronomically high. About 65 of these species arrive via accidental transport in cargo shipments or unintentionally in the pet trade. When we think of a key example involving reptiles, let's think about the anaconda population in Florida. It's a real problem in the Everglades. Some people purchase anacondas as baby pets when they're small and then release them into the wild when they get too large. I mean, how would you like to be strangled in your sleep, right? So here's some biologists who found an anaconda in the Everglades and take a look at the massive animal that is. Today, the anaconda population has grown so large that it's impacting indigenous alligator populations. In other words, the snakes eating the alligators and eating its food resources or causing the alligator to starve. Absolutely scary. Sometimes you don't think about it, but microorganisms are also invasive, bacteria and viruses. Some diseases caused by bacteria and or viruses can be technically considered invasive species. A good way to tell if a disease is considered invasive is if the local population seems completely threatened when exposed to it. If they are, it's likely invasive. Various diseases like chickenpox or smallpox in the New World is a great example because it's not quite an emerging or re-emerging disease. But you think about something like Ebola that's not common or found 
as an indigenous issue uh, here in the United States, although it caused lots of scares, didn't it, just a while back. So you can think about those thoughts and even think even worse, what if these viruses were to mutate and once they get here and they change, and that's an even worse circumstance. Mammals are another type of invasive species. Mammals did not traditionally pose an invasive problem until the growth of the agricultural industry during the mid-1700s. It is difficult to collect data on the topic of invasive mammals because many domesticated mammals have been a part of human development for so long it remains unknown when they were tamed and transported to the United States. And you can look at the list over here. Brown rats, brown black rats, horses, feral hogs, cows, domesticated kitties, and dogs, and chickens, and German cockroaches. Now, who really thought that was going to be a good idea, right? And donkeys. Aquatic. This one costs the United States more money than all of the rest that we've talked about combined. So zebra mussels are these tiny little mussels that they showed in the video earlier. And uh, they started in the Great Lakes and have migrated all the way down the Mississippi River Valley. And then you can see that there's some red dots in Texas. That's a bad thing. And you can see that there's also some dots looking out west. Well, how did they get that far? I know that zebra mussels are aquatic mussels that don't walk. So they had to get hitchhiked somewhere and they hitchhiked on a boat. That's what happened. So if it remains difficult to know exactly how much they cost each year, but the estimates vary from 250 to $500 million a year that the government spends on trying to fix this problem. They first appeared in the United States in the late in 1980s in the Northeast United States, along with the Great Lakes area as ships came in from the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. In a, a level latitude to the Great Lakes, they did really, really well, and they loved it here. And they started catching rides with other boats and making it downstream the Mississippi, and they've been doing their jobs ever since. Now, unfortunately, they've been turning up in Texas lakes, and that poses a problem. So you'll see lots of signage, and even uh, game wardens will check boats to make sure they've been properly cleaned because if you don't wash those things off, they can be transported and then fall off and get nice and happy in a new aquatic environment. Kudzu is called the vine that ate the south for a good reason. The government used it for erosion control in the 30s and then few herbicides hurt the plant and it just took over everything. It's a cute little vine until you see it in mass quantities and it's almost impossible to get rid of. So let's talk about some science servings, which is always a happy thing, right? And get into uh, the tail end of our invasive species lecture. Fire ants are virtually impossible to completely eradicate because when you place poison on them, they don't just typically die, they just move. Just a FYI, if you want to improve your chances of killing fire ants, Put diatomaceous earth, which are diatoms, that's a geology thing. And you can buy it, it has different names in somewhere like Lowe's, Home Depot, or any kind of organic gardening shop, and just tell them you're looking for diatomaceous earth, and actually it has a little silica in it, so it actually razor cuts them in half, unless it's wet. If it gets wet, the white powder won't work, so you know you're getting the right thing when it's a white powder. Fire ants eat fleas, ticks, termites, roaches, boll weevils, chiggers, scorpions, uh, mosquitoes, and larvae while aerating your soil. What a great thing they do. Fire ants also harm animals, people, and cost Texas massive amounts of money and lost revenues and treatment. So the mean little fire ant, uh, there is a solution, diatomaceous earth. Mustangs and wild horses that roam North America are also considered invasive species. There's a place where wild horses roam free at Assateague Island National Seashore in Maryland, and they have a group of mustangs which are believed to have descended from 300 Spanish horses abandoned there following a shipwreck in the 1600s. It's kind of a cool place to visit. In Guam, the brown tree snake likely arrived during the Second World War and was first recorded in the 1950s. There are so many now of these snakes that small mammals and reptiles are extremely rare in Guam because they eat birds, bats, lizards, etc. So eventually you may get so many of them and an ecological threshold succeeded and they die off, allowing for hopefully uh, these animals to return if any are reintroduced into the population. 
It is estimated that their densities are as high as 13,000 per square mile on Guam. So something you just probably don't think about is, oh, I just never really thought about a snake taking over an area, but they can. So who is the most ultimate invasive species? Obviously humans. Humans has had our footprint even on the moon, right? This is Neil Armstrong's footprint on the moon. And maybe we'll make it to Mars one day, but right now we're on planet Earth and we've done a really good job of being the ultimate invasive species. So think about that as you're building a home, where you move to, the kinds of buildings that you approve for being uh, established for your businesses, your cities, and so forth, and realize that humans are an invasive species. We have to balance ourselves with the environment somehow and live as equitably as possible to sustain the environment. So when you think about us being the invasive species, if we do colonize Mars, this is Mars right here, this would be likely where we would go. And so are we to say that we would be the only species on Mars? We don't know that yet. And are we out there alone? So another thought to ponder, are we alone in the universe? As we conclude our lecture on invasive species, I want you to always be thinking about your role as an invasive species as a human and then how the invasive species that we combat like zebra mussels that cost us hundreds of millions of dollars a year to deal with that clog up our wastewater lines our water intake lines from lakes and ruin boats and so forth why did that happen how can we prevent it from happening again and hopefully you link that the invasive species act that was passed was passed out of necessity because we had a problem that we didn't know until it was too late. Most laws are reactive, they're not proactive. I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.